Good morning, Grace and friends. Today I'm speaking about a spiritual identity in a changing world, our own and the churches. How will you describe your own spiritual identity to yourself or maybe at the point of a gun to somebody else? How might our church describe its own spiritual identity? That's the discussion I want to start. A woman in a former church at a poetry reading said to me in response to something earlier that was said, I'm not sure I want to be completely Christian. The, modifi the modifier didn't fit her, not now in her life. Does Baptist fit you or Baptist Christian or seeker? Is it easy or hard for you to identify yourself as a Christian? Being Christian can mean so many different things in our world. When Putin invaded Ukraine in 2022, the Russian Orthodox Patriarch of Moscow, Moscow and all Russia described the invasion of Ukraine as, quote, the active manifestation of evangelical love for neighbor and then described Putin as a fighter against the Antichrist and chief exorcist. Such is why the Anabaptist movement began so long ago with its belief in the absolute separation of church and state. There is a Christian supremacy movement in our nation today that feels called by God to take over government, law, the press, education, culture. And it is led by evangelical Christians and Baptists in name only. It is a threat to our pluralistic democracy and it undermines the intentions of our nation's founders and the Constitution. Perhaps such things are reasons, my friend said, she was not sure she wanted to be completely Christian. Feminist theologians say that every person needs a good and sturdy container for the self. Is this true for our spiritual lives? What about too singular an identity? Arab novelist Amin Malouf, a Malachite Christian living in Paris, wrote a book predicted, predictive of 9-11. The title, In the Name of Identity, Violence and the Need to Belong. In it, he wrote that when a person or group reduces itself to one single affiliation, the world becomes a more dangerous place. Single identities can become, in his words, murderous identities. He was speaking not only of Al-Qaeda, but other, to use his words, global tribes. So as you dig down through all the multitudes of your identity, mother, father, teacher, parent, American, all the way down to your core self, what is your spiritual identity? I think Jesus would begin his own Perhaps are these words, beloved child of God called to God's mission in the world. That's not a bad place to start. So how might we begin to think about our identity as Christians? Theologian H. Richard Niebuhr, Reinhold's brother, set me thinking more deeply about such things uh, and in these words from his 1963 book, The Responsible Self. He wrote, I call myself a Christian, though there are many who challenge my right to that name, either because they require a Christian to maintain one of uh, various sets of beliefs that I do not hold, or because they require him to live up to one of several sets of moral standards to which I do not conform. 
I call myself a Christian simply because I also am a follower of Jesus Christ. Though I travel at a great distance from him, not only in time, but in the spirit of my traveling. Because I believe that my way of thinking about life, my human companions, and our destiny have been so modified by his presence in our history that I cannot get away from his influence, and because I do not want to get away from it. In one sense, I call myself a Christian in the same way I call myself a 20th century man. To be a Christian is simply a part of my fate, as it is the fate of another to be a Muslim or Jew. But I call myself a Christian more because I have both accepted this fateful act and because I identify with what I understand to be the cause of Jesus Christ. That cause I designate simply as the reconciliation of man to God, of bringing God to men and men to God, and also of reconciling men to each other. Because I have been challenged to make this cause my own, therefore, I call myself a Christian. To make Christ's cause your own, that's a pretty good description of being a Christian. So if you were asked about your spiritual identity, say in a word or two, uh, what would you say or in a few sentences? The Quaker spiritual writer Parker Palmer, when asked to describe his mission in a so-called elevator speech, uh, something you could say between the floors of, of a building in an elevator, said, um, I take the stairs, meaning that may give us enough time to begin. The first guidance I would have is that any self-definition of your religious identity must avoid a definition that makes you separate and superior, to use the words of Richard Rohr. Uh, as the term born-again Christian was used at one time to say, I'm a real Christian. Any modifier of the word Christian should be for elucidation, not a point of pride. I might start for myself by saying, I am a Baptist Christian who wants above all to follow the way of Jesus, who endlessly enthralls and challenges me. Wendell Berry was being interviewed by Bill Moyers on his PBS show, and at some point in the, in the interview, uh, Moyers asked, do you still consider yourself a Christian? Berry answered, I still consider myself a person who takes the Gospels very seriously, and I read in them and sometimes ashamed by them, and sometimes utterly baffled by them. But there's a good bit of the gospel I do get, I think. I believe I understand it accurately, and I'm sticking to that, and I'm hanging on for the parts that I don't understand, and, you know, willing to endure the shame of falling short as a price of admission. One of the true saints of our time, Dorothy Day, founded Friendship Houses for the Poor all over New York City and beyond and started the Catholic Worker magazine. Late in her life, she reflected on her Christian faith. I just sat there and thought of our Lord and his visit to us all those centuries ago, and I said to myself that my great luck was to have had him on my mind for so long a time in my life. Maybe being Christian is having a lifelong conversation with Jesus. The founder of the Baptist movement in America was Roger Williams, cast out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony for his irregular theology. It seems that Baptists are always getting thrown out of some religious group, sometimes even their own. 
He traveled to Providence, Rhode Island, where he established Rhode Island as a colony of religious toleration and where he then established the First Baptist Church of Rhode Island in America. But soon after that, he quit being a Baptist and became, in his words, a seeker. Would the name seeker fit you? Now let's look at our congregational spiritual identity. One good way to begin would be to look again at the church's fingerprint created after a summer of conversation, which captured our core values and mission. Quite an amazing piece of work. But for today, I want to begin with our name, Grace Baptist Church. Let's begin with the last word first church. It suggests this to me, that Jesus is our center, that it is his way we seek to follow. In our text today from Acts, we see that the first way we described ourselves was this, the way, capital W-A-Y, followers of the way of Jesus. Then we learned that it was in Antioch that we were first called Christians. Following Jesus' words in John 14, <clears throat> I would say that a Christian is one on the path of Jesus, his way, his truth, his life. Then there's that word Baptist. <coughs> Pardon me. We are Baptist Christians. James McClendon, a noted Baptist theologian of our day, says that we should spell Baptist with a small b to better express our tradition and history as a non-conforming, anti-authoritarian, dissenting minority, sometimes persecuted group. It is a more modest way of saying who we are. Important, I think, these days is some Baptists seem bent on ruling the world. I think core Baptist convictions are worth holding on to in our world today. Here are some that I love. One, soul competence and soul liberty. These 17th century words mean the individual is competent to open the Bible and led by the Spirit, interpret it for his or her life, and if competent, must be free. The Protestant word for this is the priesthood of believers. The second is local church autonomy. It follows the first. This means that every congregation is competent spiritually to open the Bible and led by the Spirit of God and interpret it for its life, and if competent, must be free. Another way of saying it is every tub sits on its own bottom. No higher ecclesial body, association, denomination, bishop or pope determines the life of the local congregation. And then third and last, religious freedom and the separation of church and state. This is our greatest gift to the body politic. The earliest documents of our Republic have Baptist fingerprints all over them. Today, these principles are under great threat and Southern Baptist leaders are in the forefront of this movement. In contrast, the Baptist Joint Committee on Religious Freedom leads the way to the protection of these Baptist and constitutional rights and freedoms. We should find a way to, to learn about them and support them. Now, what about the word grace? We chose to make our name as we began. For me, this means that as we seek to worship God and follow Jesus, the foundational character of God is that God is love. God is grace and God is good. Let us thank him for it, church. Another word I used to describe, I used to describe you as ecumenical. The word comes from the New Testament Greek word ecumene, 
which means the whole inhabited world as the household of God. It wouldn't make a very good t-shirt. Every person, mineral, animal, plant is part of the household of God. We belong to each other, all of us, everything. Ecumenical means care for the earth, too. The worldwide ecumenical movement began in Scotland over 100 years ago. It sought to overcome the scandal of a badly divided church. Jesus is still praying, as he did in John, that we might be one. But there is, I think, a deeper ecumenism we ought to strive for today, one that embraces other religions of the world. Ecumenical means, for me, the unity of all Christians and, the, and spiritual friendship with all religions. Catholic theologian Hans Kuhn said in the 1990s words even more urgent uh, today, the prerequisite of peace among the nations is peace among religions. We welcome here at Grace people of different religious traditions and beliefs. We welcome those for whom a particular religious belief is not part of their lives. And we honor the integrity of such persons' lives. We welcome all who wish to join their lives with ours. I think Christ's door is that wide. One way of being a Christian is to say that Christ is the center but not the circumference of our life and faith. The meaning of Christ keeps expanding and expanding beyond words like Christian and church. So our spiritual identity as a church what words make you smile? Which ones fit, do not fit? I think Baptist fits us, but we have work to do to let people know what that means for us. How about an ad that says, we're Baptist, but not bossy? Or, we don't let Baptists get in the way of being Christian. Or, spiritual freedom lives here. Of course, the best way to identify ourselves to the world is by how we live, whom we love, whom we defend. It might startle people in asking, who are these people? What kind of church are they? Perhaps we need say no more than this. We are gods. We belong to Christ. We are not our own. God has made us God's own. For as our reading in 1 Peter says, for once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. Amen.